Okay, let's get going. Woohoo! This is number six? Number six. Oh man, we're almost out of extracurricular sessions. Oh no! Uh, who's gone to an extracurricular? Who's been at a session already in the last two days? Who's been to more than one? Who's been to three or more? Wow. Did you even go to TDX? <laughs> Does it count? Does it count if you just sat in this room for the full two days? Did you even go to this conference? OK. Well, my name is Chuck Liddell. Uh, I'm the CEO of an ISV that does integrations called Valence, and I'm one of the organizers for the extracurricular. Uh, I'm going to introduce it real quick and just sort of tell you about the format of this session that you're about to experience, because it's a little different than what you're used to. Uh, this is a long form session. We'll be in here for almost two hours. And we're going to go really deep on a very technical topic. Uh, the extracurricular is community content. These were submitted by community presenters selected by the community, polished up, made nice, uh, and prepared for you guys. And what we're trying to do is capture a conversational moment that you have at a conference like this in the hallway, right? Where you say, oh, you, you bump into someone and they tell you a story about something they're building and you go, oh, that's really cool, tell me more, and they explain it to you and you ask more questions and you kind of ex expand on this idea that they've, they've built this thing and you're trying to tease it out and understand all the different facets of it and where they got stuck and how it went. Um, and this, level, this kind of conversational learning is really uh, hard to find. It's very organic. It just sort of happens. And we're trying to artificially create it with this session. Uh, it, it actually works pretty well. I think you'll, you'll like it. But we're trying to give you a chance to find a really smart person that built a complex thing and sort of pick apart their brain a little bit and see how they, they solve that problem. It's highly technical. These aren't sort of beginner talks. They're pretty advanced. And it's a chance to... Uh, take an onion and just sort of peel it back layer by layer by layer and go deeper and deeper and deeper. And we won't have all of you at the end of the talk that are here at the start. It, you're welcome to leave when you get exhausted about things you want to go to. Um, but we want to give you a chance. If you want to go deep, we want to just match you and keep going deeper and deeper and deeper if you have the appetite for it. That's what we're here for. Uh, so this is a, a different format than you're used to. The Q&A is the session, right? Ohad's going to talk at the start and kind of set up the conversation, but the actual Q&A that we have is the bulk of what we're here for. That's the real moment uh, we're going to get some interesting knowledge exchange going. Um, so I really hope you like this format. At the start, we're going to have what we call quick talks. These are sort of our warm-up act for the main talk. Uh, two five-minute talks, just a cool thing that someone built that we think that you will enjoy hearing about. Uh, so we'll do those first, and then we'll get into the main talk and talk about this inbound data firehose thing. OK. so. Our first quick talk today is Scott. Come on up, Scott. Scott Covert began developing with Salesforce in 2010. It was a simpler time when birds were angry, your BBM pin was your identity, and people hadn't yet realized words with friends is just Scrabble. <laughs> he fritters away his days in San Diego by staring longingly at the ocean, reflecting on all the JavaScript he used to inject into the Salesforce sidebar, and regretting that he never created an S control. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, morning, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk a little bit about partial deployments with Salesforce. So uh, in an ideal world, you would be running idempotent atomic deployments and pushing your entire metadata uh, every single push into production. That means no matter how many times you run your deployment, uh, you'd get the same end result. There would be full or no deployment at all. There wouldn't be partial successes like you sometimes see with the metadata, metadata API. Um, but unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world, right? Um, there are a number of different reasons why you might be forced to run a partial deployment. Um, some, pe some of you might have orgs that are so large, you're actually over the metadata API limit itself, and you have to break up your deployments into two pushes. Uh, perhaps you're, like me, a consultant, and you're only one member of a team. There's a totally different project that's also running uh, production deployments. Perhaps you have an admin that's making changes in production and they are upset about you overriding their page layouts every time you do a build. So how do you manage uh, a partial deployment? Uh, hopefully you are using Git to do version control for your code base. Uh, what Git will provide is basically snapshots of your code over time so you can see specific versions as you're building. And there's a tool in Git called Git diff that allows you to see exactly what changed between, say, version 1 and version 2. And that's uh, basically the meat of the sandwich of this bash script that I built that essentially will run a git diff against your code base, see everything that's changed from a specific commit hash, and only deploy that into production. 
So um, this is really powerful for if you're doing like continuous integration, you can uh, run against what was just in, in master. Um, but the, the main point is, even if things have gotten complex, maybe you haven't done deployments in a long time, you can rest assured that only what you're tracking in Git is what's gonna end up being pushed. Um, so here's the bash script right here. Um, you can see uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a Frankenstein's monster. This was created before actually DX. Um, so originally it was creating like the package.xml file and so it will still work if you're using um, the metadata API format, but now it's been optimized a little bit more for the source, um, uh, source format. But basically what it's doing, it does a, uh, a, that git diff command that I was mentioning, and it'll work for constructive and destructive changes, and it'll build a deployment um, into your org based on what it finds. And it'll, you know, it'll catch things like maybe you just changed the CSS file of your Aura component or your Lightning Web component. The entire bundle is gonna need to be deployed, right? So it'll catch things like that. Um, let's go through a quick demo here. Uh, I have a scratch org right now that I'm developing against, and right now I just have one single Lightning Web component called test. And you can see that, um, actually this is my production org here, you can see that test is in production. So I'm gonna create two Lightning Web components, one called test2. And another called test3. Now I'm only gonna track test three in my uh, git tree. And now when I run my bash script, hopefully you guys can see that, um, it's going to deploy only the test three lightning web component, but not the test two. Okay, so that's done, so if I refresh this, we should hopefully see that test three is now in production, and there it is, but test two is not. So even though I got test two in my code base over here, I'm not, I didn't run a deployment, with, I didn't include it in my git tree, and so thus, it's not gonna be pushed. Um, I just wanna show real quick too, this also works with destructive changes, so if I were to then go in and delete test three, my bash script again, now it's going to actually d remove the test three lightning web component from my production org. Okay, so that's it. That's uh, one way that you can run partial deployments. Again, truthfully, this is not really like a best practice, but it's uh, doing the best with what we've got uh, with uh, Salesforce deployments. Uh, this code base is gonna be on my GitHub if you'd like more information. Uh, thanks very much. All right, thank you, Scott. Our next quick talk is Brett Barlow. Brett is a self-taught San Francisco-based Salesforce engineer who is currently working at Postmates. Brett has worked on the Salesforce platform for the last four years and holds 10 certifications, including Platform Developer 2. Take it away, Brett. Hey, everybody. Uh, my talk is on uh, SFDX custom plugins. Raise your hand if you use a custom plugin at your company. Uh, uh, so not very many people. Um, those that did not raise your hand, I feel bad for you because <laughs> you are working too hard. Um, when my screen comes up, pick them up. He's up. Um, uh, for, if you don't know what a, a custom plugin is, it is a command line utility more or less that you can write to automate um, uh, either you know, complex business operations or what I use it for is more automating the like, tedious parts of my job. Um, I don't want to be you know, making users, doing data uploads, all this stuff. I want to be writing code. Um, I'm sure why it's not. Let's just try something else. So um, in, the, in the demo, I'm gonna show a few more kind of generic examples of the plugin. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna show a few more like generic examples of the plugin, things you can do with data, things that you can do with users. Um, we have a lot of uh, other business units in the company that don't know about Salesforce, don't wanna know about Salesforce. They just need to get their function into the system. Great. Um, and. Um, using this plugin allows me to write some business-specific logic and say, hey, 
just go run this command with this file and it's all set. They don't need to worry about all the Salesforce piece. That's more or less abstracted from them. Cool. So to um, give you a quick tour, uh, briefly now I want to show a few examples. If I just run SFDX PM help, it just shows the different topics that are in the plugin. How's the font on that in the back? Can you make it a little bigger? Yeah. Oh, wrong way. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep rolling here. So uh, the first one, so we have, as you can see, we have a few different topics, anything from stuff that we're doing with Google, BigQuery, Hello Sign, Lead Score, and all this like business specific stuff. Um, I want to start with in PM user. We have three commands in here. We have deactivate, get, and upsert. Deactivate's nice. I can pass it a username. It'll switch them off naturally, but it's also going to kick off some other business processes that we need to do when we shut down users. Uh, get, I will show you more in a sec. And upsert is great. Uh, we have a process internally where if someone needs a new user, they need to fill out this nicely formatted CSV file and uh, they log a ticket for my team, we just run the command and it takes care of the rest. Uh, we have a, a security model internally where we have one profile and a bunch of perm sets. We hit this REST API with a, um, in that CSV there's a column for user type. So the sales manager will just say this is this type of user and um, in the API it just takes care of all the permission for them. So I don't need to go in the UI and remember, oh this one needs these 12, this one needs these 20 perm sets. That's all just handled by the script. Um, if I run sfdx pm user get, this is a command that I uh, wrote to solve the use case where you're given a CSV file to update a bunch of records. You have a column that is owner, and of course it has like Brett Barlow in there, not the owner ID. So, you know, let's run dash dash name Brett and it'll pull a bunch of information. Another, another flag is uh, I added this skinny flag to only return name, username, and ID if I wanted like a cleaner set. And then finally this output CSV flag which will dump that information into a CSV file if I need to pull it out and do like a VLOOKUP against an existing sheet. Uh, so another example that I have is I have this topic that's PM data and there's a few data commands that we use in there. Um, one of them is PM data copy. And this solves the use case that you're doing some work, say in a dev org or whatnot, or in a developer sandbox. You don't have any data, but you need to move some data in. Instead of making records, this uh, accepts a few flags. One's a uh, S object type. So in this case, I'm saying I want a count, I want 100 of them, and I want you to put them in stage. So it's just gonna go get them out of production and move them right over. And for my grand finale here, I have this command that's uh, data set value. This solves the use case where I get hit up and say, hey Brett, go get me a bunch of these records meeting this certain criteria, update this one column to this one value. And it accepts a few parameters. One of the, the first one's a query. In my example, I'm just getting the first five accounts of the type. And then it accepts a field. What field do you want to update? and then a value, what value do you want to put in there? I'm doing it in stage so I don't mess up stuff with prod. Um, the first thing that it's going to do is it's actually going to back up those records. How often do you have a bad upload happening? You need to roll it back. So it put it over here in this backup file for me and then actually went and did that update. So those are a few examples. This is something you should absolutely do coming away from Trailhead DX. Uh, it'll help you automate these tedious parts of your job, giving you more time back. Thank you. All right, very cool tool. Well, I hope you enjoyed those quick talks, just five minutes, something cool, someone built. Um, these are a good chance to, if you're a little nervous about public speaking, to just come up, show us something you worked on, and sit back down, no Q&A, you can just get through it. Uh, we're like first time speakers for this sort of thing too. Okay, we're gonna get into our main session, which is uh, inbound data firehose, a very interesting talk about processing large volumes of data. And the format is about 75 minutes, we're gonna do about 25 minutes of setup and we're gonna get into our Q&A portion. And the Q&A portion again starts with panelists, they're gonna kind of warm up the crowd, get the brain juices going, ask some interesting questions for, on your behalf. 
Uh, and then we'll open up the two mics front and back and start doing questions as well. Uh, a couple things, take notes while you're listening to OHAD. There's going to be a lot of stuff in here, and you may want to kind of take some notes for questions you'd like to ask or things you'd like to uh, inquire about. And then once we're into the discussion, you don't have to have a question. If you have an answer or you've done this or you have some color commentary, you just want to add a, to the conversation, hop on the mic and, and share a little bit of, of what you've done or, or help facilitate the conversation that we're all going to have here. Okay? I'm going to start introducing people. Ohad Idan is our uh, speaker today. And Ohad is a Salesforce solution architect, having worked with the Salesforce platform since 2010. Starting his Salesforce path as an accidental admin, he quickly learned to develop with Apex and Visual Force. After participating in many admin and developer meetups in New York City, he joined the leadership of the NYC Developer User Group by 2014, and in 2017 was awarded Salesforce MVP. That same year, he also started the Salesforce Consulting Practice, Praxis Solutions, and in 2018 moved with his wife and baby daughter to Richmond, Virginia, where he joined the leadership of the RVA Developer User Group. He holds six certifications and is now on the path to attaining the coveted Salesforce CTA. Our moderator today is Don Robbins. Don Robbins is a six-time MVP, application developer, author, speaker, and certified Salesforce instructor and training partner. He manages a team of instructors and subject matter experts, supports internal trailhead teams, and produces the Salesforce play-by-play -play series on Pluralsight, broadcasting Salesforce expertise to the global Ohana. Our first panelist today is Melissa Hansen. Melissa is the senior developer for the national nonprofit Stand for Children, where she has been working on the platform since 2011. She has worked on a wide range of platform projects with an emphasis on external integrations with Salesforce, <coughs> custom APIs, Lightning applications, and Heroku integrations. She is a Salesforce MVP, co-leader of the Portland Salesforce Developer User Group, and a leader of Rad Women, an organization that teaches advanced Salesforce admins how to code. She is based out of Portland, Oregon. And our second panelist today is John Daniel. John Daniel has been in software development and architecture for over 25 years and has been working on the Salesforce platform for the last 10. He currently serves as the Director of Platform Architecture for Rootstock Cloud ERP Software. He holds 12 certifications, including Platform Developer 2, Application Architect, and was recently named a Salesforce MVP. So a star-studded crowd for this session. All, <laughs> all four MVPs? Wow. All right. Okay. I'll take it away. Thank you. So, um, okay, it's working. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story first uh, to give you a little bit of background of what we were trying to do um, uh, for this project. So, we had a customer that had um, a requirement to bring in their inventory from a homegrown legacy system into Salesforce, but they didn't just want to bring the information into Salesforce, they wanted to bring it into um, an app exchange application called Rootstock which is a fully native ERP uh, that lives on the platform. So just a little bit background. This company is made up, time to play, um, sells musical instruments um, in their stores across the country. Um, they use this uh, homegrown application that does everything they need to do. Inventory management, orders, purchasing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and they have been uh, adopting Salesforce in their organization. They recently selected Rootstock ERP to kind of take over uh, everything ERP, orders and so on, and inventory. Um, and this was kind of the first thing we started to do with Salesforce. So if you've never worked with an ERP, just a, a couple of notes that are important to put it in context. Um, ERPs are generally considered system of records. So what that means is there's really strict rules around how you can change data to con to uh, uh, maintain data consistency, uh, data validity, and so on. And in general, they are transactional, which means you don't just go and update the records, rather you use transactional APIs to impact the state of uh, the data in the system. And as an ERP that lives native on the platform, ERPs are, are processing heavy by kind of by nature. Right, so the package itself already does a lot of heavy processing on the platform um, and kind of grazes the, the upper limit of the governor, governor uh, uh, limits on the system. So everything that you develop on top of that has to be very lean and efficient. Um, just a couple of considerations about the inventory we had to sync. So there's 
hundreds of thousands of uh, unique SKUs, sorry, thousands of them. Um, every item that comes into inventory is serial controlled. They have about 150,000 instruments in the inventory at any given moment across 150 stores. And the inventory tables in the legacy system get updated hundreds of times a day. Um, so that's obviously something that we had to um, kind of consider how this is going to impact when start to come into Salesforce. And then final thing before we get into the actual meat of the thing, <laughs> um, working with that legacy system, there were uh, a bunch of limitations, but two of them were very important for us to understand. First of all, the system was not able to send us updates with, hey, this is what now changed. This inventory item was just sold, or we just bought this item. But rather, all they could do is give us, whenever there was an update on that inventory table in the legacy system, they would give us the current state of that inventory. So that meant we have to actually be able to take that message, compare it to what we know about the inventory, and then identify what transaction we would have to do in the ERP. And then uh, one of the biggest limitations was that that legacy system had no way to push the data in bulk. So that meant that every update in the inventory table for every individual instrument ends up being a, a unique API call into Salesforce. So those were all the considerations. We take everything that I just described, we kind of present this in this uh, uh, data flow diagram. So an uh, event happens on the inventory tables in the legacy system. Um, the data gets pushed into Salesforce through an API with a custom uh, REST endpoint. The data comes in as encoded data, so we have to translate it into uh, human-readable values, compare it to what we know about it. Sometimes we may get messages about uh, the inventory that really result in no changes we have to do in the inventory. So there's this nothing to do step. Um, if we uh, have seen this item before and there is something to do, or if it's a new instrument we've never seen before, we need to check if the SKU already exists in the ERP system. Uh, SKUs, new SKUs were created in the legacy system and at that point in the project we had no way to uh, push them into rootstock as they were created. So we, the business expected us to be able to create those SKUs kind of on the fly if we see them for the first time. So if a SKU is needed, we kind of go into the Rootstock ERP and create a SKU in, the, in, the, in that ERP. And if it's not, or after we create the SKU, we then actually finally get to the point where we can now say, hey, Rootstock, receive this into inventory, issue it out, transfer it, whatever else needs to be done. So uh, the first iteration of this project actually uh, uh, was done by a set of developers, experienced developers, but relatively new to the Salesforce platform. And they did not have anybody um, at an architect level with Salesforce experience to guide them through uh, um, um, the architecture of this solution. So as, uh, as experienced developers, they just decided that they will create a trigger on, the, on a staging table. So data comes in through the API, gets pl placed on a staging table, and a trigger on that will then try to process all of, the, all of this data flow that we described. Right? So it would do the, all of this. And at one point, it would actually uh, uh, offload the rest of the work into a queueable. Um, well, because this uh, API was pushing one record at a time, that means that every trigger on the staging table was always processing you know, trigger size of one record. So that meant with hundreds of thousands of updates a day, we started immediately, as they started testing it, immediately noticed a lot of contentions issues, record locking, um, and just you know, reach, uh, uh, um, exceeding limits on how many queueables we can uh, uh, submit and so on. And so it immediately became clear that this approach was not going to work. Um, and that is actually the point where I was pulled into this part of the project uh, to try and figure out, hey, what can we do to fix this? And the business, which was kind of new to all of this, the jerk knee reaction was kind of saying, oh, Rootstock and Salesforce probably can't handle this load. And it was up to us to explain that, you know, it needs to be architected properly to take all these things into account. So the first thing we tried to do is we tried to see, okay, is there any way for us to bulkify? We moved everything from the trigger into uh, uh, asynchronous jobs and tried to bulkify them a little bit, keeping what they already did, most of the work, as they did it. Um, but we realized very, very quickly that that's just not going to be enough. Uh, there was so much record contention, so much inefficiency in how this process was designed that we really just had to take it all back, take it to the drawing board, and design a process from scratch. And so, you know, a few months, probably two or three months of, of work, really at that point kind of almost went down the drain from that perspective, but of course, 
there's a lot of lessons learned from that. So we wanted to process everything in bulk. Okay, processing in bulk, of course, means we had to move everything to asynchronous processing. And that is because clearly, you know, APIs with uh, uh, insert one record at a time, so we had to be able to wait for a bunch of these records to be entered and then process all of those. And so what we started to do is take these different uh, uh, blocks of work in this data flow diagram that I showed you and try to start identifying um, how much of uh, work each one of these blocks actually uh, performs on the platform. So we looked at you know, CPU time, uh, uh, SQL queries, DMLs, and just understand how these different elements of work we need to do um, fit together. And once we did that, we were able to kind of start grouping all of these elements of work into three separate uh, groups. So we knew we, we are going to need to create three separate asynchronous jobs to be able to perform all this work um, um, and you know, not exceed any governor limits and do it in an efficient, the most efficient way. So the first job we defined is this translate. I mentioned everything comes in as encoded values, so we kind of look at some code tables, find the human readable value, and do this translation on the records that came in. We also learned that uh, the inventory system a lot of times can push multiple messages for the same item in a very short period of time because of just how the legacy system worked. Um, and we realized that a lot of times we don't really need to process each one of those as a separate transaction in the system. So we, we realized working with the business that we can kind of merge all of them into one single transaction. And the business said as long as Rootstock at this point of the project has just the, the latest state of the inventory, we don't really care about being able to track everything, every single change that happened. So this translate and merge job has to iterate basically through all the records that come in, so hundreds of thousands of records, but the actual processing effort was relatively low. So obviously we have three uh, asynchronous mechanisms in, in Salesforce, future uh, uh, queueables and batch, and we decided that queueables are going to be the best fit for this part of the work. We wanted to remain good citizens of a multi-tenant environment, we realized that with the queueable we can update up to 10,000 records. So even if we, we have an hour with you know, 60,000 records or so, we can still do it with just a handful of queueables throughout the time. Um, the second part of the job is this create new SKU. When we see an item with a SKU we've never seen before, we need to first create the SKU before we can process any transactions in the ERP. So, uh, we know that there's, creating a SKU in Rootstock is actually a relatively heavy process because there's a lot of uh, supporting data that gets created, a lot of um, uh, queries that happen behind the scene to make sure you're creating a SKU that follows all of the rules and configuration. Uh, but at the same time, it's a very small num subset of the records that would actually need to uh, go through there. And so Cubal was also the, the right fit for that. And then the final uh, piece of work is the actual transactions within Rootstock. We knew that there's a large subset of the records that will need to go through that. Um, and the processing effort is actually relatively high. That's all the, the actual transaction in the ERP. And so we decided to go with a batch. Um, and of course, we could control uh, using, changing the, the batch size, the chunk size. We could control uh, a lot of the, how much are we using of the governor limits. So we had a lot of flexibility using a batch. Okay. So, Taking everything that I just described, taking the same data flow chart that we uh, reviewed a moment ago, you can see that um, you know, REST endpoint places everything in the custom staging, this translate and merge, as well as the comparing, comparing to the um, known state all happened in the first queueable. Uh, and that's when we would update the staging record and say, okay, what is the outcome of this first translate and merge? It could be nothing we have to do, because this message was merged, or this message tell us, tells us something about this inventory that matches what we already know about it, or we would need to create a new SKU, um, and we would set the status as SKU required, or we would just say, hey, this record is ready for processing uh, the transaction. So uh, records that would uh, be updated to SKU required would be picked up by the second queueable, and records with status ready would be picked up by the batch. So. How does that actually look? Let's take a look in Salesforce. And this is not an actual environment where we have this full solution. This is just part of the solution that I implemented here. Um, so here's a staging table. 
And right now we're looking at a list view that filters only records with a new status, meaning they just came in um, through the API and nothing has been done to them yet. And we can see there's a lot of information about the item uh, here, um, but we also see that nothing else happened to this record because, um, well, you don't see the status, but it just filtered on that. So now we had this design of these multiple cubals, and we realized there's a couple other limitations we have to get around. The first one is we wanted to ensure that each one of these uh, asynchronous jobs only ever executes a single concurrent execution. We didn't want the first cubal to have two concurrent executions at the same time uh, because the chances of contentions uh, um, and just you know, typical record locking was really high. So our first approach was trying to say, okay, we can find out if this job is already running by querying the Apex jobs table, right, and seeing if it's any status as queued, uh, scheduled, or running. Um, and we thought that would be good enough. We can do that, query before we try to schedule. It's already running. We don't need to do anything. Um, I, I neglected to mention, um, you can see that little sticky note on the left side. Because the API um, was uh, only pushing one record at a time, and because we needed really the data to come into Salesforce as fast as possible, we really wanted to make sure that those API transactions terminate as quickly as possible, right? So we want to get the data, record it in the staging, and just hang up that connection as fast as possible. And for that reason, we elected to not put a trigger on the staging, rec on the staging object, because triggers add a few milliseconds to the processing time, even if the trigger does nothing or very little. And just that few milliseconds add up to you know, a lot of time uh, over the processing of uh, uh, hundreds of thousand individual transactions during the day. So because we had no trigger, the only way for us to start the work, we actually implemented a scheduled job that runs every minute, and it looked for records that meet the entry criteria for either one of these jobs, these three jobs, basically based on the status value on the record, and it would then either enqueue the, the, or, or execute the, the uh, appropriate job to, per, to perform the processing. So um, we tried to use that mechanism of querying Apex jobs, and as soon as we started testing this, we realized something isn't right. We noticed that even though we're querying this and we're seeing there's no jobs uh, uh, at the time of, that the uh, uh, scheduled job is running, we're still finding a lot of concurrent execution. And what we realized with doing a little digging into debug logs is that timing is key. And while one transaction is actually scheduling this, another transaction can run, and when it queries, the job is not scheduled yet, but by the time it gets to schedule, the other job scheduled already. So it's just a whole, uh, um, you know, the database wasn't committing fast enough for the secondary transactions to identify that it's already being scheduled by another transaction. So we, find, we figured we have to uh, find another pattern uh, to control single execution of each one of these jobs. And we uh, decided to implement a pattern called mutex, mutual, mutual exclusivity. And so what we did is we created an object called mutex. And we, in that object, we had a record for each job that we wanted to control using this pattern, using this uh, process. You can see that the records have uh, a job ID. They have a job status, which is a switch to identify if the job is running or not. And they have a class name, which is which uh, asynchronous class we want to execute. You can also see that if it's a batch, like the one on the top, we can control the size of the chunk in the execution. Um, and then we had a trigger on this object, and the, what the trigger did, it identified only changes. So this trigger identified only changes when a record is updated from an off state to an on state. So you can see in lines, um, in lines 29 through 32, we check if the, if the sta state status has changed, and if it's now on, and if the class is not empty, then we uh, instantiate a, uh, the class as a type, and we find if it's a batchable or a queueable, and enqueue or execute that batch. The beautiful thing about this pattern is that we're able to ensure that there's, if there's two competing transactions that are trying to update the same mutex uh, record to on, only one of them will actually result in a change from off to on, because this, if two competing transactions, one will actually wait while the first one locks the record. So by doing this, we were able to ensure that 
there's only one event, even if multiple events are trying to update the switch to on, only one event actually gets to say, I'm updating it for off to on. Um, okay. So Mutex was the way for us to control only single execution. But we then realized we have another challenge, another limitation in Salesforce that we have to get around. Salesforce only allows you to chain one single asynchronous job to an, to an asynchronous job, meaning from a queueable, it can only run one additional queueable. We knew that in our uh, scenario here, we needed the first queueable to be able to potentially enqueue the second queueable as well as the batch. If some records end up in SKU required and some records are ready for processing, we want to just be able to launch both of them at the same time. We also wanted to make sure that this first queueable, instead of just finishing working and waiting for the schedule to call it again a minute later, we wanted to, check, to be able to check, hey, are there any more records uh, that now need to be processed by the first queueable that were created since it was launched? And if so, it would enqueue itself. So there's a scenario here where we have to basically chain three jobs to an asynchronous job. So what we discovered is we can use platform events to do this. One of the great things about platform events is that the listener on a platform event executes in a separate context from the uh, context that published the event. So even if we publish an event from an async job, the context that then listens the trigger on that published platform event executes in a new uh, synchronous context. And in that context, we can enqueue multiple jobs. So to do that, we created a new uh, platform event object. And all we had here was one custom field called mutex job name. Um, when we publish an event, we had a trigger on this platform event. And all the trigger had to do was just update the re relevant mutex record to status on, as you can see in line uh, five. Right, and we were updating them based on an external ID, which was the name of the job that was published. So if we look at this first queueable, and we kind of scroll to the bottom, you can see that we have uh, in line 29, if we need the skew queueable, meaning if we identify that some of the records require skew, we turn this uh, Boolean to true, and we add a new public, uh, platform event, uh, another platform event from the, for the um, uh, batch, and then we publish them which then turns on the mutexes. Okay, so we solved a lot of these problems. We now thought, great, we can, um, okay, so I showed you this already, we can now start to do this. So as we started to test in volume, um, we started to notice a lot of other smaller things that were uh, uh, causing trouble, right? So for an example, um, we noticed that we were running into CPU time in the first queueable. And it was very odd. We knew we were not doing a lot of work, and we really couldn't figure out why. And as we started to kind of dig through the code and start to really just put a lot of system debug with, with uh, the system time to see where things take a long time, we realized that we were doing something that to none of us appeared wrong, but we cl clearly we learned it was. And we had a map with all the records that we needed in the value set. Um, and we were just iterating. We had a for loop that was iterating over the map.values. Well, what we learned is that by calling this system method to get the values from the map, it takes a significant more, more time, significant uh, uh, amount of time to get at every single iteration. So by just taking that value, assigning it to a list before we start the loop and iterating over that list, suddenly the whole CPU time issue disappeared. Okay. So let's um, just try to take a look quickly how that whole thing works. So I mentioned we have some records. So this is the staging table. And if we look at all records, we can see that we have a bunch of records with different item inventory status on this column and a bunch of different record status, right? We have records in status new. Those are records that just came in from the API and have not been processed at all yet. We have the records that are processed, that have completed. We don't need to touch them anymore. Ready are records that are ready for the rootstock process, processing. And we have some that are SKU required as well. So this is how we kind of kept track. And the entry criteria for each one of these jobs were querying records where the status is new or ready or SKU required for each one of the jobs. So I don't want to take a lot of time going through this queueable, because I think kind of starting to run low on time. But here is, in line six, you can see this kind of query. This is the first queueable, and it's only looking for records with 
new status, we put a limit there because we knew that we had to update all of these records and we didn't want to exceed 10,000. So basically we said, next, execu next execution we get the remaining new records if there's more than 10,000 at this point. We iterate through them, we do some work, we update the status, and we also get some, uh, uh, some time. So I'll, I'll actually talk about it in a moment. Finally, we update the records and then we're able to say, if there's more new records in line 19, then let's enqueue this job again. And if there's records that require skew or processing, publish the platform event to turn on the mutex to launch those jobs if they're not already running. Okay. So I can show you this working, um, but because there's, I'm not really doing a lot of work in this, in the code that I have here, it will be very fast. Um, what I can show you is if I take this translate, which is the first queueable, and I turn it from off to on, we'll have our trigger then Trigger on the mutex will then enqueue the job. And I'll actually show you here that we have uh, no Apex jobs that ran, right? And just updating this to on, we'll then execute this queueable. This queueable will update your bound of the records. And right now I just configured it to update all of them to skew required. And as a result, it also enqueues the skew processing job as well. So the first one is right now enqueued, it's in queue, and this is the translate queueable. And hopefully by now it's already done. Nope, it's still queued. Um, what we'll also see is that all the records that were in new status will then update to skew required status. So right now we have 50 items here, and hopefully this queueable has run by now. Okay, so that's the beauty of working with sandboxes in a live demo. Uh, so while we wait for this to kind of run through, um, the other thing we needed to do is we needed to be able to report to the business um, how this process is running. So metrics were extremely important. The business needed to know how long does it take from the moment an inventory transaction occurs in the legacy system until it is accurately represented in Salesforce. The business really planned on using Salesforce as kind of the source of truth for inventory for all of their additional customer websites and so on. Right, so this, this timing was very important. So what we realized is we needed to capture a lot of timestamps during the process. Obviously we had the record create a date which would tell us when the record got into Salesforce. But then we could capture timestamps when the first queueable starts processing, when it finishes processing, when the second queueable and so on, right? Um, and so we wanted to do that and capturing millisecond level uh, timestamps was very important because you know we wanna make sure we don't just count it as a second if it's just crosses the second uh, mark by a few milliseconds. Um, and we realized that Salesforce, while Apex absolutely supports millisecond uh, daytime values, the database actually doesn't record millisecond. If you ever create a daytime, you'll notice that it always strips everything after the second. It shows you z returns zeros. So to do that, we ended up converting the timestamps to epoch time and storing them as uh, strings on the uh, staging object. And then we were able to use formulas to start calculating the difference between the different timestamps to identify uh, how this process is working. We were able to create some really, really um, illuminating dashboards that gave you a really good high level view of how is this process even working. So before I show you this dashboard, let's try this one more time. Okay, so we see that the translate queueable completed we can see that it also then enqueued the skew handling queueable. And if we look at this mutex records, um, I didn't refresh it. Right now, all of them are off except for the one that I turned to on. You can see the last modified date and the modified by. And if I refresh this, they're all back to off because they finished working, they were no, there were no more record, and they can just go back to sleep. But you can see also that the skew handling queue was updated by automated process which is the system user that process any um, platform events, right? Um, so really quickly, let's look at the dashboards that we were able to generate. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go to this in a second. I want to show you the dashboards now. So we're able to see things like the number of records that came in in the last 24 hours. We're able to look at average time to process. So we saw that within 86, 86 seconds on average, 90 seconds, less than three minutes, I mean, less than a minute and a half, sorry. We were able to process all of these transactions from the moment we got them until they're already processed in rootstock. 
Um, we can also see, though, that a max time is closer to 980 seconds, which is significant. But to answer the question, how many of these records actually take a long time, we created this other comp component in the dashboard that shows us the time distribution. So you can see that out of all of the 528,000 mes messages, almost all of them are on the left side of this uh, uh, distribution chart, which means it's less than uh, 240 seconds. And only hundreds, several hundred records of several thousands actually took a long time. Another thing we were able to kind of show is how the records distributed through the day, throughout the day. So you can see the number of message, messages coming over uh, the last 24 hours by the hour that they were created. And right underneath that, you can see the actual processing time uh, that equivalent to that time. So how, at that time when we got uh, 17,000 messages at 8 p.m. previous evening, the processing time was you know, approximately 80 seconds or something like that. So on this other chart, we show both the average and the max. So we can easily see how this process is working. So back to the other table. Let me just do this. The final thing I have to show you. So this is a little intimidating flowchart. So I'll try to go through it uh, a little quickly, but uh, in detail. This is how the final process kind of looked when you look at all of what I just described. So first of all, it all starts with a schedule drop, right? So the data coming into the staging table is really completely independent from the actual processing that happens on the platform. A schedule drop runs every minute and is starting to look for records that meet one of three entry criteria, new, SKU required, or ready to process. If it finds record in status new, it will then turn the mutex for the first job to on, which will then start the skewable. When the queueable is over, it will check, do I have any more records to process? If the answer to that is yes, it will re enqueue itself. And if no, it updates that mutex back to off and goes to sleep until the schedule will turn it off again. A second thing it would check in the end, did I, did I result in any records updated to status ready? And if so, it will publish this mutex event to turn the mutex on for the third batch. And the final criteria, it would also look at, did I result in any records with SKU required? And if so, it would publish the platform event to start that queueable. A second criteria for the uh, schedule job is to check if any records are with SKU required. And if so, it will update that mutex to on. Uh, that mutex can also be updated to on from that uh, platform event that I described. It would then start the second queueable that does the creation of this queue. It would update, it would then at the end check, do I have more records to process now? If so, re enqueue itself. Otherwise, turn the mutex back to off and go to sleep until the schedule turns it on again. And if any records were updated to, re to ready, it will again publish this ready platform event, which then bring us to the last job, which could be started by the scheduled or by the platform event. This is the batch that actually iterates to all the ready records and then calls the rootstock APIs to perform the transaction. It does the same thing when it's done processing all the records it queried in the start method. It will check to see if any more exist. If so, it will re-execute itself. And if not, it will turn the mutex back to off. So a lot of words, um, a very complex process that I, I hope I made a, a, a good uh, effort at conveying to you here. And uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> <sighs> Can I hire you? Uh, oh, I don't have a process that complex. Never <laughs> wow. Um, so why don't we open questions um, with our panelists. John, do you have anything you'd like to start with? Um, I guess, so one of the questions I had is um, you showed a diagram where it was two cubicles and one batch process. And uh, so how did you, did you have to run into any issues around um, other, other processes in the, in the org, um, other processes using batch processes? How did you work around that? What was the impact of those? So, um, yeah, sorry. You, so um, the question was, why did we elect to use the queuables and the batch, and did we have to, we, did we run into uh, other um, users on the platform using them as well and, and uh, um, hitting any limits that are related to that? So one of the reasons we elected to use two queuables and one batch rather than all of them in three batches 
Well, because we all know that Celsius has a limit of five batches that can be executed concurrently in the system. And we did in an org, right, across the entire org. And we did not want to consume any more than we absolutely had to. We wanted to be good citizens of the platform, good citizens of our org, and leave as much resources available to, um, to other users or other future processes on the platform. Um, another thing that we had to consider was Queueables are great, and you can obviously enqueue the, the, uh, the job to run again. But Salesforce actually has a documented, um, let's call it feature, that they call uh, the back off mechanism. And essentially what it says is that after you execute the same queueable, chain it multiple times, you may start to notice that it takes more time between the time you enqueue it to the time that it actually starts processing. So that was actually a real big concern for us. We weren't sure what that would look like. Um, if we'll start enqueuing them and then having to wait minutes between executions. Um, I don't know why, but when we did uh, large volume testing, we observed that it was not happening. The queueables were just enqueued, and generally within seconds we'll start to execute. Um, but we definitely had to be very aware of what other teams were doing on the platform uh, to make sure that nobody just floods like the queuable flex job, the flex queue with queuable jobs, then you know, we'd, we'd hit out exceptions. And that actually brought out larger conversations about creating additional patterns for uh, controlling queuable execution. But the, obviously, I'm not going to go into this here. <laughs> so you, in your demo, you alluded to you know, the, the batch. You had some, some jobs queued, and they were taking longer because you were in a sandbox. So when you were trying to test out is, you know, are we going to have delays when we actually move this to production? Like, how did you figure out how these massive jobs were going to perform not in a sandbox environment? Very good question. Um, so we were doing all of our testing in, in a full sandbox. Um, this company is a very large organization. We didn't need to worry about things like API limits. They had so many users that there were, you know, uh, tens of millions of API calls available a day. Um, and also data storage was not a concern at that point. Um, but uh, because we were doing this in a full sandbox, we were working closely with Salesforce, and they, uh, they told us basically we can work with their mission critical support, MCS, to set that sandbox to run in performance mode, so that when we were doing the full scale volume testing, um, the, the, the sandbox should perform like a production environment. I can tell you that when we were doing this, we were happy with the results, but a little disappointed. And when we moved to production, even though the sandbox was in, in performance mode, when we moved to production, we observed uh, probably a 30 or 40% increase, increase in performance. So it was, it was, you know, we did whatever we could to try and measure that um, and in the sandbox and expecting that, uh, you know, the very, very worst case scenario will we'll end up in production with the same thing we observed in the sandbox. But we were happy to discover that it wasn't the case. How do, you, how do you ensure that the cubicles and the batch job are running when they are actually supposed to be running? What if you had failover? What, what kind of events or issues did you have that would make the process fall? So um, in our testing, what we, what we have found is a lot of times if we had an unhandled exception, then the batch or the cubicle wouldn't complete and would not turn the mutex back to off state. And in that scenario, the trigger would never start it again. And in that case, we basically had, you know, stuck, right? The jobs would never get started again. Um, so obviously, the first thing we tried to do is really make sure we handle all of our exceptions properly. Um, and that really allowed us to, <laughs> easier said than done, right? But we've done a lot of testing. Uh, you know, there was a whole QA team that was designed to try and think of whatever crazy scenarios. And we ended up actually using real production data from the production system piped into our sandbox environment. So we knew we were looking at real world scenarios data. And over the first couple of weeks of this high volume performance with the production data piping into Salesforce, we did hit a lot of other smaller kind of uh, issues that we were then able to resolve, make sure we handle everything correctly. But kind of to do the catch all, what we did also is we looked at the schedule job and we said, okay, the schedule job runs every minute. So we can look if the mutex is set to on and it's been updated last time more than a minute ago, and the Apex job table doesn't show this job running, that probably means there was some kind of a failure. And so then we would just update the mutex back to off to make sure that it can restart. Along those lines with sort of exception handling and errors, 
Do you have the ability to replay? If you lose records, if, if the inbound system call fails for whatever reason, can you go back and can you replay those calls? What kind of sort of fault tolerance or replay abilities do you have? So um, very good question. So because we, again, we wanted the API to be as quick as possible to just hang up the call and let the next call come in with the next piece of data, um, the API did very, very minimal validation. It really just checked that we don't get null for a serial number, because without serial number, we just don't know anything, right? So we, that's, that's scenarios where we would re we'd reject the data. But otherwise, we would just blindly take the data. If it meets this very minimal requirement, we would just take the data and record it into the staging table. And from that point, it was the, the process's job to kind of be responsible to highlight errors, validation, something that isn't right. Um, and so from, from a replay perspective, you know, we were, we, even when we were getting multiple messages and we were consolidating them into one, we had separate fields on that staging object to always maintain the original message we got versus the actual data that we consolidated now and we're going to use for processing the data. So we were always, it's not really pure replay, but we had enough of the original data and all of the data so that we we'll always go back and be able to kind of reconstruct the uh, events that happen in the inventory system and you, what the end result was in Woodstock. Do you have any kind of like true up process since you have these two you know, critical systems and we all know, you know things can and, and do go wrong and it's important that they're in sync. How do you, you know, do you have a periodic <laughs> check to make sure that the numbers are matching in both systems and how do you address it if they don't? <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's a phenomenal question and a question that we asked very early on. Okay, now that we will have this system, how do we know that we're actually running and it's actually doing what it's supposed to do? Um, without getting into too much detail, what I can tell you is that the organization had no ability at that point to say, this is our inventory across all of our stores. Every single store was its own server in the basement running an application. And while there was a, a sync up job into a main server in a, in a data center, it was impossible for anybody in the organization to just go into one place and look and say, oh, this is our inventory across the entire company. And it's kind of ridiculous for you know, a really, really large organization, enterprise organization, that has you know, all of this data just distributed and nowhere um, um, that easy to, to look. So what we ended up doing is <laughs> the, the true up had to be extremely manual. We had to go store by store and into the database of every store, get the database, um, try to do it in like low peak hours because things could change and not depending on when we query. Um, and if we find discrepancies between them, we would need to validate, validate that it's because of these timing issues. Uh, but it, the true up was very, very manual. There was no continuous true up. It was just not possible. There was no way for us to do this. Um, but. You know, we did this, we took a week to really just go through all the data and do comparisons, and that's only, the only way we were able to validate. But the, the outside of this, the, the out, outcome of this is that once this process was actually running, we had another dashboard that for the first time in this company's 30 years of operations, they were able to go into one place and say, show me how many, vehicle, how many um, um, uh, instruments we have in, in our inventory. Show me, you know, what kind of, how many of this queue we have across the entire system. Show me movements, show me how many were sold in the entire system today in almost real time, right? Within, normally within about three minutes delay from the legacy system. So that was a massive uh, value to the business. You guys exhausted? Question? <laughs> Why don't we, op up, well, let's open it up to the floor. I'm gonna ask you to come up to the microphone. Um, and if you have a question, if you I would can. line up. Hi. Um, all right, I so I you. noticed for your mutex in your staging records, um, you actually use like custom objects. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious why maybe you didn't use custom metadata types for either or both of those. So um, for mutex, we could not use custom metadata type because you can't put a trigger on a custom metadata type. And for the staging, um, you know, the volume of data that was coming in, it just doesn't really uh, uh, lend itself to using for custom metadata type, right? Custom metadata type I would normally consider to use for configuration options, data, um, control of applications, not so much for volume of data that comes, comes through. Tisha. So uh, one of the things I learned when I used the, the chained curable is that uh, there's no guarantee 
that it want it will stop or not. So, so I have to use the custom settings or metadata record to control it. When things really go wrong, and uh, I have to stop it. I have to use a custom setting. I don't know. Do you have that a controlling mechanism in your system? If we want to be able to just stop the process from running. So the only thing that would kick off these processes is either one of the processes would kick off another process or the schedule job would kick off the processes. Right? So if we want to stop and pause and, and take a, a moment to look at the data in a current state kind of thing, which we did during our testing a lot, all we needed to do is stop the schedule right? and, and abort the jobs that are already running. In our scenario, there was really no kind of need to be able to just say, hey, let's, let's turn this job off. We actually did have a custom, custom setting uh, to control kind of a master switch. We can turn off uh, all jobs, all custom jobs, or just individual jobs kind of by class name. So we did do something like that, but, but for this process, it wasn't really so much necessity. This is the process that if everything is right, it should always be running. There's never a scenario you want to stop it. Okay. Because I had this experience that uh, the cure ball will never stop, and there's no way to control. So the platform just died, you know. The next day... Why, we, why would it not stop? Uh, You're just queuing itself again and again? Yeah, yeah. Somehow we, we went into this uh, infinite, infinite loop, and then, you know, that's a horrible story. So, yeah, so uh, you can always use, you know, developer console, anonymous code, and system dot board job, and... Stop it. <laughs> I don't know for this curable, but uh, I, yeah. I didn't find this, the way. But uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, but yeah, it's, it, it's, uh, it's definitely important to put controls into your, into your asynchronous job so you can control what they do. In this case, it just this specific uh, control was not required. Uh, hi. Very clever architecture. Thanks for sharing. I was curious uh, if there were any conversations or considerations around using middleware or uh, doing data processing off-platform to uh, avoid such clever uh, maneuvering around some of the Salesforce limitations with, with data processing? So the short answer is yes. There were considerations uh, around doing that. We wanted to try and do everything on the platform. We definitely considered um, using Heroku or, or other middleware to, to try to do pre-processing. The challenge was that we really wanted to rely on the data in Rootstock for kind of comparing what we got to the known state. And you know, it's all, it would all be about replicating, and, and you'd still have to get it into Salesforce. And the other thing is that, in the end of the day, we have to perform those actual transactions in Rootstock. And that's part of this heavy processing that we solved with the, with the third batch. Right? So putting it away on somewhere else wouldn't really save us a lot. In fact, it might actually make it a little bit more complex and increase the time to get data from the legacy system through their corporate ESB to a middleware, do some pre-processing, and get it into Salesforce to process in Rootstock. So in this, in our specific use case, because the end result is, by necessity, transactions on the platform, we can just bring in final data onto the platform, is, is all I'm trying to say. Rootstock creates, when, when you perform in like an inventory transaction in, in Rootstock in any ERP, you don't just update the inventory status to say, now I have five instead of four. Rather, you actually create a lot of audit data about you know, when was this transaction happened, financial re uh, implications of the transaction, um, serial records, audit records, and so on. So for, for this specific use case, uh, using a, a middleware for, to do external computation wasn't really plausible. But it was definitely something we considered early on in the, in the origin of the design. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I'll save the harder ones for later. Um, you know that, that asynchronous processing is my jam. Like, doing weird stuff with async Apex is my favorite. Um, so just quick context on the, the back off stuff. Uh, I swear that when it first came out, it was documented as an exponential back off. I feel like I saw that somewhere. I can't find that documentation anymore. I tested it a few months ago. And what it does is a cubable that enqueues another cubable will execute immediately three times. Right. And for the fourth and n number of times beyond that, it's a one minute delay. Yep. It's not exponential, it's a one minute delay. So an infinitely chaining cubable will end up going every minute. Um, but if you do a couple quick cubables in chain in a row, it'll be right away. Mm -hmm. uh, and so quick question for you. On the staging table, how do you clean that table up at the end? Do you, did you use that? Sort of for audit purposes, or were you cleaning it out, purging it? 
So, so we were purging it. Uh, at that point, we were purging it every 30 days, just because you know, with 500,000 on average, between five and 600,000 messages a day, the table grows very quickly. And obviously, with big table, even with uh, uh, very selective queries using index fields as much as you can, you start to you know, to, to experience uh, um, degradation in performance. Um, and so we kept it, I think, for 30 days, just for the purely for the ability to go back and say, oh, something wasn't right. Let's see it, the history of this transaction and identify when it happened. Um, but even back then, we were talking about at some point, we'll just turn to me down to seven days because there's really no need to keep that audit history. The inventory lives in the root block data structure and in the legacy system. But we, I, I read the same document, by the way, about the back off strategy, the infinitely curable one minute. It was just interesting that it's not what we observed in, in real life. And that was a pleasant surprise. We were willing to, to live with a one minute delay because again, the cubals were supposed to handle the first cubal, a large number of records. So even if it took a minute, it would just handle you know, up to almost 10,000 records. Um, and the second cubal was not going to run that frequently, um, probably you know, a couple dozen times a day, if that. Hi, um, really cool. I had a couple of detailed questions about the staging table. The first one was just asked. Um, and the second, uh, so each row in the staging table represented a discrete API call. In the consolidation step, were those rows deleted as part of the merge and consolidation? Or was there a merge operation? How did that actually go down with the first queueable? Um, so that's a really good question. We actually went through a couple of iterations of how we handled that consolidation. Um, but in essence, we, when we queried the data, we, we built a map with all the records for a serial number ordered by the created date. So we took the last record and we basically anything that was missing, because sometimes we would get different uh, uh, data elements in the API uh, uh, data, and we would just kind of bring it all up. If there was any field that was empty on, uh, on the latest record, we would check if any of the previous records has that and would bring it, bubble it up to the top one. Keep the top one to process forward, and all the other ones we would just update the status to consolidated. So that would kind of be an end state. No additional processing happens after a record is updated to consolidated. Okay. Thank you. Hi, so for your staging table, uh, can you help us understand, we've got lots of questions about the staging table, I'm sure there's more behind me. Uh, can you help us understand um, why you chose to go with an S object instead of say just platform events, because you're using platform events elsewhere in the system, uh, what limits you might have run into where that, started, that pattern started to break down? I love that question, I was hoping somebody would ask it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so we definitely evaluated platform events. Platform events obviously is a relatively new technology on Salesforce. Um, and it had some limitations that we just, we were not able to uh, live with at a time. So platform event trigger, unlike a normal trigger, executes in the context of up to 2,000 records at a time. Um, we knew that, yes, platform event, so we wanted to bring the data into a staging table rather than just publish blindly a platform event because it's a lot easy, more, it's more easily digestible if you want to look at the data rather than having to look at the streaming API, right? Uh, but we were toying with the idea of all, using all of the processing with platform events. But the fact that the batch size of a platform event is 2,000 uh, made it a little harder. And what we realized is that even if for each one of these records we pl publish a platform event, we did not want to do it in a trigger on that S object because we wanted to keep the right operation as, as, as lean as possible. Um, so that would mean we would have to have the schedule execute something that publish an event to do the processing. Right, and that started basically to lose its appeal. Um, the other thing is with Summer, we're actually getting a wonderful feature on platform events, which is resume from. With a resume from, you can actually control and say, okay, I executed 200 of the platform event trigger, let's resume from 201, and that will get a brand new context. So we now can control the size that actually gets executed in the, in the context of a platform event trigger, but that wasn't and still isn't available um, until the next couple of weeks. But there's also the aspect of a, the platform event trigger is a singleton in nature. Yes. So. Right. So, so tra plat <laughs> thank you, John. So platform event triggers are singleton. So that means you only have ever um, a single execution of a trigger on a platform event. Right? So if you are publishing 10,000 events, you'll get a trigger that executes 2,000, and the next 2,000 will execute in, a, in the next context of the trigger. And the reason for that is 
if you look at the platform event documentation, there's one line that says, we guarantee order of execution. And the only way they can guarantee that message 2001 doesn't get processed before message 2000 is to wait until all the first 2000 are completed and only then start executing the next batch. Thank you. Great. You wanna add something to that? Well, just that that would have the effect of bottlenecking everything up in that one single process. And so you might get 10,000 events coming through and they're all just gonna sit there for a while. Beginning. Yeah, but you accomplished a lot of that with yeah. Texas anyway. Well, yeah, we, we kind of, we, that, was, that would not have been a bad thing. We kind of wanted to accomplish the same thing. But the fact that we could not control the execution size, the fact that we, um, within, the platform event also executes in a synchronous context. So you lose that ad the added, you know, 60 seconds, 10, what, 60 seconds CPU time, yeah. and more SQLs you can perform. So it was kind of, you know, we, we were def I was, I love platform events. Um, but it just wasn't quite a good fit at that time. Please. The other aspect would be backup. So if the platform event f process fails, there's no backup record. There's no record in the state, the payload itself in the staging tables to track it. Yeah, yeah. you'll lose some of that. Uh, another follow-up is, do you monitor mm -hmm. and track how you're doing against your asynchronous load? Because you've got a rolling 24-hour number of asynchronous actions you can perform. Do you monitor how you're doing against that, where you're at with that state? Um, we did monitor that, I think, relatively manually, but then we actually implemented, um, we, we worked with uh, the Splunk team, so they actually started to query against the Apex jobs, and we were doing some analytics around how we were abusing the asynchronous uh, framework, um, but we were, we were well within our limits, yeah. Great. That, was, that was just a little secondary, too. We actually went live first and only then added that monitoring, so. Surprise. Yeah. But we, we had no issues, so that was a good thing, so. This was actually the, for such a complex process, we went live with this and it just worked. And that was phenomenal because we were very scared that it wouldn't. <laughs> um, so we have a pretty similar uh, workflow where we you know, have this uh, volume of data coming in then we create a staging record and sort of process it into queuables and that sort of thing. Um, well, one problem we encounter is that uh, we have, uh, say, some events that might depend on an earlier record that hasn't been processed yet. Curious if the data that you were receiving um, sort of experienced that sort of issue and any sort of um, design decisions you might have made about that? Yeah, so that's actually very, very interesting as well. So I mentioned very briefly that the, uh, the, the legacy system is actually a very distributed system, right? So every, every store had its own database. Uh, we noticed this the most in scenarios where inventory is transferred from one store to another. Sometimes we, would may, we may get the message from the receiving store before we get from the sending store. So we had to add some logic to say, if I got a message from the sending store and we've already processed a newer message from this device, for this, uh, uh, for this instrument from another store, then we need to ignore that one. So we actually had a bunch of like ignore statements that if certain criteria were met, we would not process. Again, the, one, of the, one of the critical things for, the, for this one was the fact that for this phase of the project, they didn't really care to track so much the, you know, have Rootstock have track of every single update to that inventory. They just wanted to make sure that at any given moment it's as accurate as possible. And that was a really big um, consideration in this design, right? If we had to capture everything, the consolidation would probably have to be wiped off, right? And we'd probably experience a little slower performance because we would be processing more transactions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. did you just like kind of get rid of that record or does it still stay in the... It still stayed, yeah. We, okay. we kept all the records. We, we never deleted any record until we purge the table at 30 or 7 days, whatever it was. Okay. Um, but we would update the status to something that was meaningful to tell us why this record never processed. And one of the things that you can kind of see, I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about that here, um, but on these records, if you look at uh, like this processed record, for example, those, all these columns that you can only see the first two characters, those are the timestamps, right? So we have the epoch time recorded on at every step. And, and again, if I look at the code for this translate cubal, for example, you can see we captured the start time right at the beginning of this class. And then for every record as I update it, I also assign the end time for that record. When was this record processed within the execution? Um, and so you could also look at things like this record did not go through this because there's no timestamp, right? So you can see 
where the record stop processing, but just looking at this timestamp for the SKU processing, if there's a processing timestamp but no SKU, you can know that it didn't go through the SKU required. Right? So we were able to create a bunch of formula fields that also looked at some comparing some of these field values to get, tell, tell us something else about what the process went through. Thank you. But the, the, the staging object ended up being a super wide object. It had all the fields for incoming data. It had all the fields for the merged data. So basically duplicate everything. We had the encoded values that we got in. We had the decoded values. We had all these, we had probably about 20 timestamps we were tracking, and then a bunch of formula fields that were doing comparison between a bunch of these combinations. Um, so the, the object probably, if I remember correctly, had like over 100 fields on it. Fun stuff. Good presentation. Thank you. Uh, and very good questions, too. Uh, going to back to your initial, like, you know, one of our first two slides. 150K transactions against 100 plus stores per 24 hours? Or so it's maybe not 150K transaction, 150,000 uh, items in inventory, right? Okay. So they had 150,000 instruments, but the, the number of transactions was approximately five to 600K a day. Okay. And the reason for that, I didn't really talk about that a lot, but every morning, in every store, they would take their scanner and would scan every single update. <laughs> they would scan every single item they have in inventory to ensure that the inventory is accurate. <laughs> and just that scanning resulted in an update on the inventory table, <laughs> just the last scan time. And that we, there was, we worked with them. We tried to eliminate a lot of that. It just was impossible. So we ended up getting, that's why when you kind of look at the dashboard, <laughs> you see that peak in the morning. In the morning hours, that's when they were doing those scans. <laughs> And you can see kind of, you know, it's across three time zones in the U.S., so it kind of builds up and, and, and goes down. But about 600,000 transactions in 24 hours. You can see that right here. This is in the last 24 hours. In, in 24 bit. hours. Yeah. So in a given batch, how many transactions are ex expecting? Like, you know, maybe like somewhere around 25, 20K? 20K what, I'm sorry? Per one execution. Um, it really depends on when, right? So if, okay. you, if yeah, we process a batch in the yeah. peak time, mm -hmm. the batch could actually iterate through you know, several thousand records in an execution. Um, if you look at lower peak time, you know, between the different execution could be only a thousand records came in. Okay. Right? So do, do you have any numbers like, you know, during peak and non-peak? The reason I'm asking in detail is like, you know, we do have exactly the same scenario. We have like, you know, customers across the globe. They have different peaks. Like for when we are sleeping, somebody else is working, right? So my, um, my question more going towards like, you know, okay, you're getting X number of like, you know, in a batch and you're trying to do in your queueable from your current solution towards like, you know, means what you have done. You're st still doing like, you know, your SKUs, existing SKUs mm -hmm. or not, you're still doing it you're still going and hitting against your 150K of your master, right? So for every, it may not be every single record, but the batch, whatever you're getting into the staging, you are somehow rolling up or like, you know, consolidating and saying out of 10, I'm picking this guy mm -hmm. and I'm going with this, right? So I want to know some numbers, like, you know, if you're getting 30,000 transactions in a so batch and you end up processing only 5,000 because another 25,000 is just filtering out noise or whatever you yeah. call. So can you give some, like, you know? So we, we captured, I, I can't really share with you the specifics, but oh, I can okay. tell you that we captured a lot of this information. So on this, this dashboard on the bottom left, you can see the number of SKUs created in a day. <laughs> now, I, I kind of simplified what is SKU creation, because within Rootstock, the way that we configured Rootstock, each store had its own set of SKUs. Mm. So we had to create SKUs in individual stores. And there were many reasons for that. Um, that's the difference but kind of between the SKU create and the SKU cloned. Um, we also captured some metrics that are not here um, around how many uh, records get processed in, in an individual uh, uh, batch, yeah. right? So the, basically the number of records returns from the query locator. Uh -huh. um, so we, we did capture a bunch of metrics about that and we, we, we used that to do some, some analysis, but for the most part, it was really just to kind of inform us um, how the data ebbs and flows kind of through the day more than anything else. And is it something that we need to be concerned? Mm -hmm. And you know, this, this table here 
uh, the, the two tables on the right side, you know, showed us exactly what is happening during those peak hours, right? And that was critical to really um, understand because the business wanted to say, I can't have, it's great that you can tell me you can process everything in under three minutes, except for peak time. So what does peak time look? Because I can't say, I can't say to my website team, hey, you can rely on Salesforce to have three minute accurate inventory, except for peak time, because customers don't care about peak time, right, when they log into the website. <laughs> so we needed to do a lot of this kind of distribution, uh, a lot of, uh, a little bit more statistical uh, uh, analysis. And, you know, some of these uh, dashboard components that you see here are a little counterintuitive. It took us a little bit of finagling and creative formula work to, to be able to generate those in a, in a Salesforce yeah. dashboard. Yeah. yeah. Um, now you have, like, you know, this solution is in production and up and working, right? What's the lessons learned? And if you recommend something similar, like, for example, if we want to implement something like this, what will be your recommendation based on your learning mm -hmm. and what the new features that were provided by Salesforce? So the first lesson learned is just do it right the first time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just figure out what the problems are before you do it and do it right the first time. But that's, that I, I haven't yet figured out how to do that. Um, some of the lesson learned obviously is, so one of the biggest things we actually learned when we first started to, so I said we piped production data into our sandbox, we found out that no matter how many business SMEs we spoke to, in the IT team, in the business side, what they told us about what we should expect from the data was not what we actually ended up getting, <laughs> right? So don't rely on people telling you, oh, you're going to get data X in this format, in this volume, and whatever. Look at actual, like, what does actual data look like, right? And that's why connecting the production legacy system to a sandbox environment was invaluable for us because that ended, ended up being, I think it was like three weeks of marathon uh, tweaks to the process just to be able to handle all these different scenarios where there was a lot of things about we got a message from this store telling us one thing and from another store telling us something else. How do we reconcile that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest lesson learned is, you know, obviously take into consideration your, your processing, try to, to break it down into manageable pieces. Do your, we did a lot of analysis on our consumption of governor limits for each element of work. Um, and then also a lot of analysis on, 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 okay, so now when we start to merge them, what are some of the interaction in those processes that's going to change how the governor limits are, are consumed? Um, yeah, so. Thank you that. very much. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's a very relatable one, especially for those of us that uh, deal with large volumes of data like this. Uh, my question is uh, kind of on the monitoring piece. This is uh, a great dashboard and uh, more specifically around like maintenance of the solution. Like are there things that you're watching for when it's like, oh, execution time is breaching some threshold. We need to go mm -hmm. back and refactor certain pieces of it. Like, can you talk through your, your strategy with that? Yeah, so, so um, what we ended up for proactive monitoring, we ended up relying, we, we, we took a bunch of different approaches. Um, I think a couple of the monitoring events we, we ended up implementing on Salesforce. So if something, I can't remember exactly what scenarios we did on Salesforce or not, but if something, some, some failures, we would actually shoot a message to like support queue from Salesforce. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of the monitoring on the actual performance and identifying like outliers or exceptions was done actually by using Splunk as an external system, querying the data, doing aggregates, doing a little bit more computational stuff to, ident to identify things like, okay, the average is starting to creep up or, um, and creating some of the monitoring or on Splunk. Gotcha. No, that's, that's, yeah. that's good insight. And this, this was, you know, we started seeing like managers that never really looked at it coming and starting. We would have like a, a daily, when we were getting close to go live, we had a daily kind of presentation to the, to, the, to the team at large, more than just the people that were working. Everybody was involved in related processes. Mm -hmm. And people that we've never seen or heard their names before started to come and just look at how this dashboard and how we were making progress and how time was starting to shrink. And start, we then started creating the, the dashboard that shows the actual inventory statistics, right? How many are sold? How many per store? What's the store with the most stuff? What's the most sold instrument? What's the, you know, how many do we have most? In, all these different metrics that the business just never had visibility into. And it's, it's mind-boggling when you think about, you know, large-scale 
nationwide enterprise that just has this massive inventory, that they can't really do any insights about how their organization performs. So this was a phenomenal uh, thing to start seeing the, the business finding interest in this. Very cool, thank you. Can thank I, you. Can I throw in a related question, just tagging off that real quick? Um, it's about trust, because building this scale of integration requires the business to, to really trust that you know what you're doing in building this, and especially considering you're, you know, there was a false start with you know, people didn't really understand the platform. How did you go about making sure that the business team was with you the entire time and that when you got to the rollout piece, people trusted the data that it was actually accurate? <laughs> you stole my question. <laughs> so the first thing I'll say is that we first started testing it with high volume with the real production data. It was a very kind of nail-biting moment for me because this was really kind of the proof of did I design something that's going to work or, or am I really kind of just basically everybody's going to start pointing fingers at me, right? Uh, I was extremely happy when, it was, when we turned on the switch and it was like humming. Um, but there, there was definitely a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, mistrust from the first iteration because it was built, yes, by people that really didn't understand the platform limitations, how to work within them. Um, but the end result of it, there was a mistrust in the platform. Can the platform even capable, be, capable, be capable of handling this? And specifically, is Boot Talk ERP, the, the time that it takes to process those transactions, is that going to be problematic? So there was a lot of just trying to say, hey, guys, listen, we know what we're doing. There was a lot of talking conversations with um, Salesforce um, solution architects. And, and uh, they had a bunch of, you know, such a large organization, they had a bunch of Salesforce uh, um, architect level resources on site. So we had a lot of like reviewing with them the design, re code reviews, um, and, and just trying to prove that we know what we're doing, right? And that Salesforce kind of says, yeah, this, is, this looks like it's, it's a good design. But there, there, were, there were moments where I had clashes with Salesforce architects where they told me, why are you doing this? This is not, you should use out of the box things. And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> I can't, it's, no, there's nothing out of the box that's going to let me do the things I'm doing. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, I'm curious to your thoughts on how the to be released data capture change events might impact your solution. Um, for this specific requirement, for this specific thing, I don't think change data capture really um, relates to this just because we're looking at data capture from others from external system and they're not really lending themselves to um, this is what changed in the data right they can I, we can only export what's the current state so we can't use data capture from external system and we using data capture uh, uh, change data capture on this staging object wouldn't really give us any anything else that we didn't already get um, I will say that I'm I love, I mentioned that I love platform events. CDC is directly related to platform events. Um, I think it's a phenomenal tool. Uh, in the keynote yesterday, they mentioned about asynchronous triggers, which really is change data capture, which essentially just publishes an event of a change of data, right? Yeah. So we already have a bunch of use cases for that uh, on things that are somewhat related to this. So for example, we, now that we have inventory in Salesforce, we want to be able to shoot it out to consumers. And with platform events, we can have external subscribers, but it's not always uh, uh, that easy. <laughs> uh, it's Comet D, which not everybody likes, and it's uh, you know long polling, which you know is not uh, the best on networking uh, bandwidth and, and efficiency. And um, so, using change data capture allows us actually to do a lot of other things with this data. Now that we have it, we can look at the we can create uh, uh, CDC events on the rootstock tables that get created as a result of this, okay. rather than yeah. use CDC for this. OK, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. I thank just you. have uh, one question, or two questions, maybe. Uh, which system is the system of record, whether something's going wrong or not? You have the stores, you have the centralized server, you have the staging table, and then you have Salesforce and probably some other tables. So which one would you go to when? you were curious what was happening regardless of it. So at, at that point of the integration, the system of record was still the legacy in-store database. That's considered a source of truth, not even the main server, because the, that sync only happened one, once an hour. And in fact, at the time, the .com, the website team, used the main server to be able to show people what instruments are available online. 
Um, but that could be an hour de delayed. So an instrument may have already been sold, scrapped, transferred to another store, but you, on the website you'll still see it as available. Um, so, but at that point, the source of truth was the legacy in-store system. But what we were working towards with this, this, this is the first step in making Salesforce and specifically Rootstock within Salesforce the system of record. Okay, then there's a second question based on that. Um, is the inventory all serialized or is there some inventory that is quantity based, meaning I have 10 of these and we don't yep. know what the serial number is? Um, the answer is yes, there is a non-serialized inventory, but at this point we were only synchronizing the serialized inventory. We only cared about the instruments and all instruments are serialized. Um, the inventory that isn't serialized is like what we would consider spare parts, like uh, you know, a, a peg to repair a guitar or strings, things like that. They were not captured in this project, but there was a plan to, to bring that in at a later time. Okay, and with the inventory uh, system of record being the final, the farthest down the chain from what actually happened, um, and one hour being the time between when you get an, an update from the, the actual real system yeah. where people are transacting, what did you do? Because you didn't talk about any reversals. I do understand, like you talked about differences, but reversals. So with, with uh, inventory, there's a financial impact when you do something to a specific serialized item. So now you have an hour between when you find out. So right before you pick up from the system, somebody makes a mistake. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. And then now this serial number goes all the way through the system, gets all the way to the ERP at the end. What do you do when you have the oops situation? And you know, how did that affect the deployment of your solution? So I, I can tell you worked with ERPs. Um, it's a really good question. The, the short answer that I'll give you now, and if you want to talk to me about it later, I can Afterwards. share more details. Sure. The short answer I'll give you now is that we weren't concerned with the financial side yet. So Rootstock as an ERP was actually creating all these financial transactions, but we were not planning to rely on them. We knew that these are, these are considerations we would have to take into account. Um, but as a secondary phase, we were start, starting to do a lot of other things that would resolve some of these things that we were planning to. I actually ended up leaving this project somewhat after this went live, but uh, the plan was definitely to, to, to get there. And eventually, the, the final goal is really for the transaction to be initiated from within Rootstock. Right? So you want to sell something, you create a sales order in Rootstock, you, pu you fulfill that sales order. That's really where we wanted to be, but to the, the first thing we had to do is just create the visibility for the company and have the inventory in Rootstock so we can start to sell that inventory. If it's not yeah. in there, you can't sell it, right? Perfect, thank you. Um, I got two things. One sort of building on what Melissa was saying a while back uh, about sort of day reconciliation and designing a system like this, uh, you can get a situation where you have like almost two designs, one for the delta and one for like the, the initial load. Your situation, I think that probably was less of an issue, but you certainly had some phases here where before you went live, production looked like something, and then after you went live, production looked like something for a while, and then it sort of settled down, right? Can you just talk a little bit about sort of those phases? Was there some data in production that you were sort of layering on top of, or was it empty? And then you know, how did that rollout so, happen? <laughs> um, so yeah, we start, when we went live with production, production was basically empty. There were no SKUs, no inventory on hand in production. We toyed with the idea of preloading, taking like a snapshot at some point from the legacy system, and trying to load that into rootstock to, to have a starting point and then really just start to get the delta values. Um, it proved impractical, both because it was really hard to get an actual, this is the inventory right now across the organization, uh, but also because we realized that trying to load all of this in bulk into rootstock was taking a lot longer than just letting the integration. So when we turned on the integration, we realized a couple of things. First of all, the first few days, are going to be a lot more processing heavy because every item in the first load will need to have a SKU created. And that's a really slow-ish process. So we knew that when we turn it on, the first few days are going to be kind of like processing is going to be like here, and then it's going to start tapering down as we start to see just repeating messages or deltas, right, changes to inventory. Um, the other thing that we had to take into account is that if an inventory item is not updated, we'll never know it exists. So that was part of this um, manual analysis we did later. And in fact, that allowed us to find some inventory items that had been in limbo inventory for years that have never been scanned again, and they're just there. That didn't even realize it's still on the books. But yeah, that, that was, our approach was just let the integration kind of settle down 
before we let consumers start to, to look at the data. That's really interesting that it empowered the ability to sort of go look for the outliers, like the gaps, and find serials that weren't in the new system and figure out why. Yeah, it created a lot of visibility uh, into, into these you know, general things about the inventory that the business, business just never had any way to, to find out, right? Um, this is obviously the, one of the biggest powers of having all of your data in one repository we can just run a query against or you know, aggregate or run dashboards or create other analytics of your data rather than having to do it in you know, 150 individual servers and try to reconcile it somehow. All right, last question for me and my follow-up to that. Um, did you have any s part of the design that the staging tables got stale at all? Was there some point where you no longer considered one of them to be data you wanted either because you had received a more recent update with the same information or it just a certain amount of time had passed? Or did you just process every staging record always in order? So, so in part of our consolidation, we looked also at like the, the timestamp from when we got the message from and identify if there's an older message, we would always take the newest one and process just the, what, what's the latest state. And I kind, of meant, I kind of alluded to that earlier when I said that we all only care about the you current state, not all of it. You said sometimes you get partial messages, I thought. So yeah. it didn't sound like you'd always rely on the most recent message being a complete snapshot of that record. We could not, because sometimes there would be messages that contain some information. So it could be two messages. This message contained the left three rows, columns, and this message contains the right. So in our consolidation, we would take it, take the latest we know that gave us the data. So if there's five messages or 10 messages, we'd look for the latest that has that message and then consolidate it up to the, to the re one record that we ended up carrying through the processing. Thank you. All right, well, we're almost out of time, but I get to ask a question. Um, I want to know sort of more on the soft side uh, about the team that built this. Um, both the initial team that was assembled to take on the project initially mm -hmm. what you and, and your and I don't know what your relationship was with assembling that team or if you were just pulled into that team and then how the team may have morphed over the life of the project bringing it live and what the team was left with to maintain <laughs> it going forward in summary in 50 words or less oh no. um, so I, 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 I was not involved in selecting the team but um, I was involved in training them. I was brought in as an SME for Rootstock. So Rootstock brought me as an SME, as a contractor. And so I trained them on you know, all, of the, all the tables they need, the objects they need to, real, to, to know, to query, how do you perform the transactions, consideration, configuration, all this fun stuff. Um, I will still say to this day, even after they've completely miserably failed, a set of extremely talented developers, just very new to Salesforce. They, were, they had months of experience in Salesforce. They have gone through you know, a lot of trailhead. They brought Salesforce CU to teach them you know, a condensed two weeks developer, advanced developer course, and super sharp guys with a lot of background in How many? the program. Uh, the team that worked on this was four developers. Um, what happened is there was some other things that were changing in the organization, and the team that built the second solution was actually a separate team. Uh, completely other set. One of the developers was, was carried through. When you say the second solution, you mean after you did a sort of first iteration yep. and it wasn't functioning and then you had to do some redesign and I know you had to keep going with redesign. The team transitioned at a certain point. Was it the entire team transitioned? Pretty like, much you the guys entire go team away transitioned. Yes, they went to another project altogether and we got a brand new set of developers. Was that decision related to the failure? Um, no, uh, at least for the most part, no. Okay. I think there, there was some you know, um, displeasure by the developers themselves. They felt they couldn't do what they wanted to do. And in my mind, it's, you know, obviously, I, I like to say it when I train new developers or developers that are coming from other languages is that, you know, governor limits is something that usually new developers come to the platform, they hate it. Why do I get imposed these stupid limits that seem arbitrary? Um, but what I like to say is that governor limits really just force you to be as efficient as you can in your know, programming, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, at some point you get, I'm as efficient as I can and I still hit governor limits and that's, you know, then, then you come up with creative ways to get around it. But I think there was some, some frustration on some of those developers' uh, team, but there was just um, another project that was a much better fit for these teams, these individual developers' skill set the business decided to move them there. Can you give a sense of the duration, the project, uh, s a scope of time, that st from, from inception to 
first, I don't want to use the word yeah. failure, but first not, it wasn't as good as you wanted it to, you went live and it just hummed, as you said. So the first iteration took about, I think, three months to build. There was a lot of building blocks be before that. Mm -hmm. So the three months is not just purely developing the first solution. There was a, you know, we, we, we implemented a lot of enterprise patterns. FFLib was, was the enterprise um, library we ended up using. Um, there was a lot of kind of training, a lot of tweaking, a lot of learning in as they program mm -hmm. um, through code reviews and so, and so on. But the entire process, I think, the first iteration took about three, three and a half months to get to the point of failure, basically, mm -hmm. with another two or three weeks of trying to see if we can make tweaks to improve it, and then just saying, yeah. we can continue doing going down this path, but we, we will only get it that far, and it's never going to be where we want it to be. And so then we went back to the drawing board, and there was probably assembling a new team, getting them trained on Rootstock again from scratch, and getting all this, probably them, another three did you months. Have to, did you have to train them on Salesforce as well as Rootstock? No, they actually were Salesforce developers for the most part, yeah. So was there some leverage because of that where it took a less time to ramp up the second team? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit, but um, the, the other developers, the, all of the Salesforce training was done previous to those three months starting. So they were already familiar enough with Salesforce that they could do what they needed to do. Yeah. Um, and we just needed to kind of highlight the, oh wait, well, you're in Salesforce, you have to be so, so that second phase to humming was about how long? With the I want to say probably about three, three and a half months for the development Same. as well, and then maybe another three weeks of tweaking once we started plugging it to, to real production data. So what I'm saying is the whole thing is anywhere between six and eight months to get it from inception to humming? Or I maybe think a little bit we're more. looking at probably, yes, probably about six to eight months, yeah. Okay. From, okay, we know what we want to do, or at least we think what we want to do at first, to, yeah, we have something that we can deploy to production. That's not bad. Well, yeah, the business was at first not very happy about it, but yeah, well, they, they learned to live with it. <laughs> All right, we got to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to actually hand this back to Chuck because I want to let Chuck do the final wrap up. I, I don't think anything further is needed. That was a, a very deep dive. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, thank you.